Lieber Herr Dekan, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Gäste, es ist mir eine Freude, Sie zur Antrittsvorlesung von Marcella Januzzi begrüßen zu dürfen. Es ist mir auch eine Freude und eine Ehre, Marcella einführen zu dürfen und ich möchte kurz Ihren Lebenslauf äh, vortragen. So, Marcella studierte Physik an der Universität Mailand, wo sie auch ihre Doktorarbeit abgeschlossen hat, und zwar in Materialwissenschaften. Dabei hat sie atomistische Simulationen von Materialien für die Mikroelektronik ausgeführt. Anschließend hat sie einen Postdoc absolviert mit Michele Parinello, zuerst in Stuttgart am Max-Planck-Institut für Festkörperforschung und anschließend in Lugano an der ETH. Während dieser Zeit hat sie sich mit Enhanced Sampling beschäftigt. Das heißt, sie hat Moleküldynamik, Simulationen und Methoden entwickelt, um sogenannte seltene Events, also äh, ja, Events, die sehr selten vorkommen, zu simulieren. <lacht> In 2004 hat sie sie zum ersten Mal an die Universität Zürich zu meiner Gruppe gekommen und hat dort Simulationen von Röntgenabsorptions- und NMR-Spektren durchgeführt. Anschließend von 2006 bis 2009 war sie am paul scherrer institut und hat wiederum etwas ganz anderes gemacht, nämlich auf der einen Seite immer noch Simulationen, aber jetzt ganz neue Materialien, nämlich Materialien für die Kernforschung, besonders Materialien wie Urandioxid untersucht. 2009 ist sie dann zurückgekommen an die Universität Zürich, zuerst wiederum als Postdoc, seit 2012 als Oberassistentin in meiner Gruppe und seit dieser Zeit beschäftigt sie sich mit homogener und heterogener Katalyse, vor allem Moleküle an Metall- und Oxidoberflächen und zweidimensionalen Systemen. Und über diese zweidimensionalen Systeme wird sie uns heute vortragen. Bitte. So, thanks a lot, Jürgen, for your introduction. Thank you for being here, friends, family, colleagues. It is a pleasure to introduce today to you uh, what is my activity research in uh, computational material science. And uh, I would like to start uh, um, my uh, presentation with uh, some uh, general concepts about nanostructure and nanoscience. Nanoscience is uh, the field where we think to manipulate materials starting from the elemental units, so atoms and molecules, and to extract from this manipulation uh, nanostructures that have very special properties. When we talk about nano, we mean something that cannot be seen by naked eye, or in, uh, oops, sorry, uh, I pushed the wrong button. Um, go back. Okay, um, that uh, is uh, in the order of uh, 10 to the minus nine meter. The first time that uh, nanotechnology has been in postulated was uh, uh, still in the 1959 by Richard Feynman, where in his uh, public lecture, he gave uh, this talk, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And he was uh, uh, really uh, theorizing that uh, one can uh, structure materials starting from atoms. In fact, this is the way as uh, molecular uh, and biological systems are formed, so processes occur all at the uh, nanoscale dimensions. 
But what is nanoscale? If you look at a, a DNA molecule, the diameter of this double strand uh, super molecules is about 2.5 nanometer. Uh, a nanotube, that it is a cylindrical structure of uh, carbon atoms that have very special properties, can be as small as uh, 0.4 nanometer. This is 100,000 times larger than a human hair. So we are in, this, uh, in these dimensions. But it's not just talking about very small materials. They have also very special properties. Because going at these dimensions, they uh, can show unique uh, features. First of all, a very large area, because the ratio between area and volume is extremely increased. That means that there is a much larger interaction with the environment, uh, enhanced reactivity. So all unique properties that we want to exploit to um, build new functional materials. But uh, nanostructures were used uh, already centuries ago. Um, this is uh, a stained glass window, and these beautiful colors that was uh, uh, characteristic of windows in medieval churches is uh, given by particles of different dimensions, gold and silver particles, uh, that are mixed in, in this glass. The modern time of nanotechnology starts when we are able to characterize these materials and these structures. And this became possible uh, advancing the experimental technique and one for all uh, is uh, the uh, S, uh, scanning tunneling microscopy that actually was awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in 1981. And uh, since then, we can really resolve uh, structures uh, in a real space at the submolecular uh, level. And here you see uh, the absorption at specific sites, so the site selective absorption of uh, an iron phthalosaline molecule, and you can really observe the orbitals of this molecule, thanks to this uh, atomistic, uh, atomically thin tip and the, uh, measuring the current between the tip and the substrate. Since then, a lot of products in our daily life are characterized by the use uh, of uh, nanostructure and nanotechnology, starting from batteries, capacitor fuel cells that use atomic thin uh, layer of materials like graphene, uh, in, the, in the production of clean energy like solar cells, uh, or even in medicine, uh, where nanoparticles are used to deliver drugs, uh, or uh, in creams, where nanoparticles are the basic uh, of uh, sun protection, they are zinc nanoparticles. And it is uh, of uh, a couple of weeks ago, the news, that uh, now we have uh, the smallest ever computer um, produced by IBM in, in microelectronics nanotechnology is really dominant. And uh, you see today we can have a computer that is as big as a grain of salt. Uh, here actually you see 128 of these computers. And it is a full computing unit on a chip that has a processor, memory, connectivity, possibility, and storage. So I would say that microtechnology is probably the field where we most feel the impact of, of nanotechnology. But uh, there are several issues uh, in uh, going to these small dimensions and the fabrication and the control of the properties of these systems is one of them. The, most common uh, um, fabrication technology, in particular for macroelectronics, uh, up to now has been uh, of the type of uh, uh, top-down. That means we take one macroscopic system and tries to modify it to reach the dimension of nanostructure and to um, uh, shape the system as uh, to get the desired properties. And nano optical lithography, electron beam lithography, scanning from patterning uh, are of this type of techniques. For example, to fabricate uh, this uh, 
beautiful a single layer of carbon atoms that is graphene that has this lattice, has this honeycomb lattice with uh, wonderful properties. The first approach was by exfoliation from graphite and actually this approach was awarded by the Nobel Prize and obviously all the discovery of the properties of these materials. But to have full control on, on systems, to have this atom, atomistic precision and to really shape the properties that we want, and also to reduce the cost because uh, the uh, instrumentation that you need for this uh, um, uh, resolution uh, with a top-down approach is, uh, is very uh, uh, expensive and is approaching the limit of what is really possible. The best way to think is to use the natural interaction of molecules and atoms and let them self-assemble and organize in architectures. This is an example how to obtain graphene by this bottom up technology. So by depositing molecules on a surface, let them assemble using their own self-interactions and then sort of process them, for example, by irradiation, making them react, and then by annealing, obtaining the uh, single atomic layer that is graphene. So this is the way to go. Issues and aspects to consider are also there because to obtain the desired properties and full control, reproducibility, large-scale materials, high throughput, all this has to be still studied and, uh, and advanced to go to the market. Okay, and uh, what is making the computational science uh, scientists in all that? Well, from a theoretical and computational point of view, we can provide a lot of um, contribution to the study of the details of this mechanism and of these materials. We can look at the details of structures, for example, how the molecule combines with a surface, which are the properties. Um, we can calculate or compute spectroscopic properties and compare directly to experiment and um, in, sometimes interpret better the experimental uh, data. We can simulate with dynamical means um, uh, propagating the motion of atoms uh, processes and uh, uh, configurational sampling of, uh, of complex systems. Here you see two molecules uh, binding and uh, and dissociating when they float over a surface of water. But uh, we can go beyond and make a full sampling or uh, as large as possible sampling of phase space, uh, giving information on thermodynamics and kinetics of reactions. And for all that, we need to have good software algorithms and uh, uh, tools that allow us to extend the scope of the simulation to obtain all this detailed information and contribute to the nanoscience. As an example of uh, which is the pathway, the procedure to go from a real problem uh, to the model and then to the characterization with computers. I would like to talk about a very important uh, topic uh, that it is uh, nowadays, so the production of clean energy and possibly exploiting uh, the energy uh, of the sun. And that means to activate reaction that uh, transform, convert the energy of the sun in chemical bonding and using uh, this uh, uh, conversion to generate and then store uh, energy in, uh, into molecules. And uh, this uh, is a process uh, that has many steps, including uh, uh, in this so light harvesting, uh, water oxidation if we want to generate these bonds starting from water molecule and producing oxygen and molecular hydrogen and then proton reduction and combining all the parts of the system together to have an efficient device. When we do modeling, uh, then we have to take just one part of this because we want to do first principle modeling, we want to look at atoms reaction, so we have to start to consider 
the material and the characteristic of the material. So let's start with uh, the water reduction catalyst that in this case had to be anchored to a semiconductor to make it possible to uh, control it and uh, to be sure that one can activate uh, the uh, catalyst uh, through uh, the charge separation in the semiconductor. So then we take uh, a good catalyst that has been uh, studied already in other condition, and this is, uh, in our case, uh, uh, cobalt perforin, where here you see the cobalt in the center, this uh, light blue are carbon atoms, and we have some nitrogen atoms, and here this uh, uh, cyanonitrogen atoms that are very specific of this molecule. This has to be anchored, so that means absorbed on a surface, and our semiconductor is titania, uh, because of all the, the positive properties uh, that uh, this semiconductor has in this respect and because it's very well known. Here the red are the uh, oxygen atoms uh, and uh, the other are the titanium atom. And this system, so depositing the molecule on the surface and uh, looking at what happens has been studied obviously with experiment and there are several indications that uh, this is possible and uh, the structure is formed, the complex is formed. What the experimentalist might give us uh, is some image like this where you see an STM uh, image where there's the bright uh, um, spots are indeed molecules that have absorbed on the surface. They can even recognize that the molecules are oriented so they have uh, a certain orientation with respect to the, the lines, the rows of atoms, uh, of oxygen atoms uh, here. And, um, and that there are a few and that there are stable. Um, however, there's no really uh, atomic recognition of the various part of the molecules and we do not know how this molecules is actually absorbed and which is the binding, the stability. So if we simulate it, we can search for different position of the molecule, look at which are the uh, best uh, uh, of, uh, conditions where the molecule is the most stable, and we notice that this is the configuration with the mo molecule indeed tilted with respect to the rows of atoms and forming uh, bonds, uh, <laughs> forming bonds between the nitrogens and the titanium atom that are quite strong, and the tilting with respect to the rows, uh, it corresponds uh, to what has been observed uh, experimentally. And uh, we can also simulate the STM image, and we indeed obtain a similar uh, pattern for the molecule, so this elongated pattern uh, that is uh, tilted uh, with respect to the rows of atoms. Okay, but if you want a device, you need much more molecules, you want an active device, so you want a monolayer or even more because it has to be um, producing uh, um, activities so of producing uh, hydrogen. And, uh, and therefore, the experimentalists tried to increase the coverage and actually they succeeded and they could even uh, tell us uh, using the lead, uh, which is the pattern of molecule that self-assemble on the surface, uh, telling us that uh, it is a distorted uh, monolayer uh, with uh, this superstructure at eight, a centered eight times two superstructure. And now the important thing to understand is which, is the, which are the electronic properties of this monolayer and if it is usable as a catalyst. So if the properties of the entities in this structure of the surface and with uh, combining other molecules are still the properties of the catalyst we are interested in. And then we can study the electronic structure. And these are experimental um, UV spectra and these are density of states calculated. Uh, let's look uh, at the blue line here and the blue curve there. This corresponds exactly to the cobalt purfurin. And we can recognize that in the gap of the semiconductor we have these molecular states. These are molecular states, they are not dispersed. They are the states of the molecule that we are interested in. In particular, this here is the HOMO that also indicate that there is a, a charge transfer and a binding of the molecules with uh, the substrate and this is also indicated uh, by a certain uh, band bending uh, of the semiconductor. So okay, so the electronic properties seems okay, but still we are looking at the system in vacuum. So there is the surface, there is the molecules, but uh, we need uh, the solvent, we need water to um, um, <clears throat> do the reaction we are interested in. 
and then we put this in water. And uh, now you see our system is becoming more and more complex. We have here a bulk water system, so liquid water that moves as water. So this is uh, with the diffusion, the thermal activity. So this is a system that has to be simulated at room temperature and ambient pressure. And uh, it is becoming uh, several hundreds or thousand uh, atoms large to simulate all this. And we can ask ourselves, are the molecules still stable in water? What happens at the surface? We see the interaction between water and the molecules and water and the surface. We know that water absorbs on titania. And then we simulate it, and we see that indeed, where there is space, water molecules absorb on titania, and they almost hide beneath the molecules. They are probably trapped there. And if we elongate a bit the... Uh, simulation, we also see that there is a water splitting here. So here now is an OH, and this is a, a proton that it is bound to the surface. And it is actually this uh, uh, reaction seems to be catalyzed by the presence of this cyanonitrogen that at a given point interacts with uh, this oxygen and this uh, hydrogen. OK, so now we have uh, sort of all the ingredients, and we could go on and uh, study the reactivity and uh, uh, other processes on these surfaces. And apparently, the same result of trapping water molecules and OH uh, between the molecules and the surfaces among the molecules is, has been also recognized experimentally recently. And the two things were done um, in separated uh, uh, rooms, so to say, that was really predictive in this sense, and the matching was uh, quite uh, uh, nice. But what do we need? We need a theory. Uh, to do this type of simulation that uh, help us to um, control and to calculate the electronic structure and the interaction among the atoms uh, with uh, high chemical accuracy. But uh, still, we need to be able to do large simulation. The successful theory in this respect is density functional theory, also awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in 1998. And it is the theory of choice when you want to uh, simulate condensed matter at uh, the first principle level. The success of this theory uh, comes from the simplification of very co complex uh, problem that is the solution of uh, um, the interaction among el electrons uh, uh, of a, a large system, so solving Schrodinger equation that it is a not tractable problem for large systems. And uh, the um, great idea here was to uh, simplify this problem, uh, rewriting it into an equivalent problem where electrons are treated like independent particle, uh, moving in uh, um, mean potential, let's say, that it is due to the presence of the other atoms and electrons. And uh, in this uh, potential, we see the external part that is uh, from the atoms, so some uh, uh, electron repulsion. And here, this term contains all the rest, so the correlation among electrons. And the better we can describe this term, the more accurate is uh, our model. The theory has the advantage that we can explicitly include electrons. It is predictable, there's its accuracy, and we can really have the electronic structure and from this uh, extract observables that can measure and compare directly. To the, uh, to the experiment. On the other hand, uh, it is uh, computationally more effective than other uh, quantum chemistry approaches that might be more accurate but are limited to a much smaller system and, uh, and then not, uh, not suitable for these problems. Another important ingredient is the configurational sampling. So we don't need just one structure, one configuration. We want the mechanism. We want to see how systems evolve. We want to explore many uh, configurations and from this extract uh, information in thermodynamic, of thermodynamics, of kinetics, uh, and uh, of processes. That uh, is done for us by treating atoms as classical particles that move and propagate according to the standard equations of motion, so the Newton equations of motion, the forces are instead extracted from density functional theory calculations, so from electronic structure calculations. After the sampling, we can extract the uh, observables, so the, the physical quantities, 
by averaging over uh, the, the samples we have produced, knowing that molecular dynamics reproduce the right probability distribution, so the, the right statistics, once we give the desired thermodynamic conditions that mean temperature, pressure, uh, and other possible external conditions. So then we have our trajectory and we extract the uh, properties from our trajectory. Okay, then the problem remains that uh, we still have large systems and we want to simulate many, many configurations. So depending on the, the problem at hand, we have to consider that the small system can still be simulated on desktop or laptops, but when we want to increase the scope of our simulation, we have to uh, resort to, to go to uh, supercomputer facilities. And, um, and for this, we fortunately have the possibility to access several supercomputers. Again, uh, talking about tools, uh, we also need the software. And uh, in our group, there is a big activity is in the development of, of a suitable software that can handle the simulation, can run our supercomputers, and we have access uh, to one of the biggest computers in the, in the world, that it is here in Switzerland, in Lugano, and also to other computers. And the optimization and the parallelization of the software on this type of computer is a key ingredient to be able to do this type of simulations. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have uh, the tools. Of what? Uh, uh, ah, okay, this is still uh, considering the scaling of our simulation. As you see, the development of this software has improved over time. So here you see the time that is needed for one MD step of a, a box of water molecules, a 64 water molecules. And if we see what we, where we were in 2006, so we could simulate this one time step in uh, more than five seconds and today, obviously increasing the number of processors where we uh, run. So now we are below one second. That means that uh, there is a, a significant speed up in uh, the uh, throughput of our simulation. This also thanks to the development of computers. Here you see the scaling of performance uh, of the um, 500 the most powerful computers that have been benchmarked over the years. And we stepped from some teraflops now to the exaflops. Exaflop, and that means that what we can do today in one one day, five years ago, 10 years ago, we needed the more than one month. So that uh, is really extending the scope of the simulation. Okay, so without this development that to go hand in hand with the development of the methods, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this type of, of science. Okay, and uh, now I would like to, to show you another couple of examples of complex systems where we have two-dimensional structures uh, often in, uh, in contact with some uh, environment. And uh, the interaction or the interface between water and transition metal is uh, one, one very important system, um, in particular for catalysis, and this with platinum uh, in, uh, surface with uh, CO molecules uh, uh, absorbed in water is uh, a prototype system that it is uh, very much studied and also a very good playground to test uh, our methods and our sampling uh, techniques. Um, the uh, experiments uh, to study this, uh, um, this type of uh, environments and interfaces are also now developing a lot and they are becoming able to really look specifically at what happens at the interface, looking at the dynamics and at the structure. But this is also an advancement that it is new and, and uh, really fantastic. But, uh, we can obviously also uh, contribute in the understanding of this experiment. In this case, we are looking at infrared spectroscopy. This is just a linear infrared spectrum. And in this paper, 2007, they were comparing the CO stretching mode frequency and intensity. Uh, 
uh, in dry conditions, so where CO is absorbed on the surface but uh, in vacuum, and uh, in aqueous conditions, so adding water uh, on top of it. And what they could observe is a shift, so a red shift of about uh, uh, 40 uh, inverse centimeter in the frequency and an increase uh, four times in the intensity. And then we're trying to uh, um, uh, explain this, uh, uh, this observation, uh, considering that there is some interaction between the water environment and the CO molecule that might weaken or, uh, this uh, bond or anyway change the frequency here of the fluctuation of the CO molecule. From uh, our point of view, we simulated recently the same interface, considering one fourth uh, uh, absorption, uh, monolayer and absorption of CO. Uh, we could uh, still uh, 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 watch the system in uh, uh, vacuum and uh, with water. We observed, uh, as expected, that the CO molecule absorbed on top of uh, the platinum atoms. And we also observed a uh, restructuring of the water close to uh, this interface. So there are two layers of water molecules that do not behave as liquid water. They absorb on the surface. You see these green water molecules are really absorbed with oxygen on the surface. The yellow water molecules are a bit higher, but still interacting with the surface. And only beyond these two layers, there is uh, the film of water molecule that behaves as bulk water with liquid uh, behavior and the mobility. And it's the presence of these co-absorbed water molecules that makes a difference because this co-absorption generates a charge transfer between the water molecule and the surface that results in a back charge transfer from the surface to the CO. And here you see accumulation of charge in the antibonding state of the CO molecule that weakens the, the CO bond and shifts the, um, uh, the frequency. And we also can reproduce uh, the uh, enhancement of uh, the uh, intensity that it is uh, due to the presence of the dielectric uh, above here that polarizes uh, the bond. So this is also done with dynamic molecular dynamic simulation because we have really to sample the explicit solvent uh, and, uh, and uh, the conformational change and uh, the environment and everything. So that uh, are quite large simulation as well. And to finish up with uh, systems, I would like to talk about uh, the uh, <coughs> nanomesh. That is uh, a system that uh, uh, occupy my time for a long time, for for several years now, and is still occupying a lot of our simulation uh, computer time. And uh, this is uh, a system that uh, an organic uh, two-dimensional uh, system that was discovered uh, some years ago at the University of Zurich in the Institute uh, of Physics by depositing uh, uh, borazine molecules on a hot uh, rhodium surface um, that catalyzes uh, the dissociation of this molecule and the assembling of a new structure that it is uh, a two-dimensional uh, atomic thin layer that has the same lattice as graphene, but is formed by boron and nitrogen. And since the lattice constant of this 2D layer and the lattice constant of the surface do not match, then uh, there is not a commensurate absorption of this layer flat on the surface, but uh, where the nitrogen sits exactly on top of a rhodium atom, this, the layer binds and goes close to the surface, where not, uh, stays higher up and the interaction is weaker. The superstructure that it is formed and that it is uh, visible by STM experiments uh, is uh, a corrugated regular structure with uh, a depression of about a 2 nanometer size, a uh, periodicity of about 3.2 nanometer, and it is uh, rather regular and uh, very extended. It is formed by 13 by 13 un uh, units, so BN units, over 12 by 12 uh, rhodium lattice sites. This is a, a, a lot of interesting, uh, uh, mm, so it is very promising for a lot of interesting applications like templating molecules, uh, clusters, uh, functionalization, site uh, uh, selective um, uh, functionalization and catalysis. Uh, and uh, even once we have this membrane, by 
removing this membrane, using this membrane for treating water and uh, uh, nanofluidics. And let's have a look at a couple of things. So first we have to simulate the structure and obtain the same properties, and we did. So here is again the experimental SDM where we distinguish pore and wire, that it is this uh, interconnecting area where the pore is called this depression here where the layer is binding to the surface. We can simulate the structure. Here is the BN layer seen from above where the colors are given according to the height from the surface and you see that we have a quite a good match with the experimental image. We can also simulate the uh, STM image and look at the modulation of the electronic properties uh, of the electrostatic potential and uh, try to study all the possible systems uh, like absorption of molecules and uh, formation of defects and other things. In particular today I would like to talk about uh, one a bit exotic case of uh, functionalization of, uh, of this membrane uh, by uh, a beam of uh, low energy argon ions. This has been started as an experiment in order to try to selectively fu functionalize uh, the uh, membrane and it did after uh, this uh, has been done, one could uh, observe in the STM image some protrusion that are these uh, uh, brighter spots that happen to be only at specific sites that are at the wire and preferentially if we distinguish two sites in the wire, the A and the B, preferentially at the A wire, at the A site. And the question is why, what are these beams? Okay, we have sent argon. Uh, we can imagine uh, that this is argon, but where and how it was trapped there. So what we could do, uh, starting from this uh, very inspiring input from uh, our colleagues, uh, experimental colleagues, was to try the same thing. So just to send argon to the, to the system, to the structure, and see what happens, uh, which type of uh, morphological changes occur. We send that argon with different speed, at different angles, at different positions, wire, here we call this rim or in the middle of the pore, and uh, we collected a number of simulation and uh, data to uh, sort of make a statistic of what could happen. And, uh, and now, uh, actually, what happens, and this I have to thank Ralph for this uh, beautiful movie, uh, I wouldn't be able to do such a nice thing. So that one of these simulations, and then uh, you see how argon, if impacts in the right way, at the right position, can break this, uh, the membrane, and then it can be trapped and diffused through uh, the interlayer region to a site where it is uh, stable, and actually this happens to be below the wire and preferentially below the A-type side of wire. It leaves behind some defects. We uh, didn't uh, uh, highlight before, but there were indications also in the STM image that there are defects, not everywhere. So there are remaining some defects, but probably some other get uh, self-healed. And, uh, and then we could also try to simulate the self-healing of a defect. Here you see the broken membrane with some uh, um, dangling bonds. Here is the argon atom that has just penetrated the membrane. And if we run our simulation and we wait at room temperature, I think this is a bit higher temperature, and we wait long enough, then we see that uh, uh, the uh, layer is able to heal itself and to reconstruct the original honeycomb lattice. Then we can obviously study the properties of these trapped argon atoms, consider the fact that more than one argon atom can trap at the same time, site, so the argon atoms can diffuse, and, uh, and uh, there are other, other things that uh, can be considered uh, with respect to this uh, system. The experimentalists went beyond that and they started uh, after sputtering or after implanting uh, the membrane, they started, uh, uh, okay, this is the system, uh, they started annealing even farther and uh, arriving to 900K, they found out that uh, once the system is back, cooled back down, the argon is not anymore there, so there are no more protrusion, but what remained are these uh, 
voids, these nanovoids of two nanometer size that correspond exactly to positions of pores. And the assumption here is that by annealing, there is a diffusion of defects of argon that uh, co-aggregate co at some pores and uh, peel out uh, some part of the layer in a can opener mood. They, they, this part is removed and these voids uh, remain. And now we have a very extended layer with an homogeneously uh, distributed uh, pattern of voids. And this is a very interesting, so nanometric voids. And this is a very interesting system if we can peel it out so we can exfoliate and then use it as a molecular or a, a membrane or a nano-functionalized membrane, for example, for ion transport or treating of water, desalination and other very interesting application. How to exfoliate? Well, we had already some experiment and simulation back in 2010 showing that by intercalating hydrogen uh, to the nanomesh, we can release the bonding between the membrane and rhodium because uh, the hydrogen is uh, replacing the nitrogen-rhodium bond. And so this becomes, uh, let's say, weakly bound. And by further advancement in this observation, uh, very recently, uh, Wang Yao and collaborators uh, did this exfoliation by electrochemical means. And they could really peel out uh, the membrane, transfer it uh, to another substrate that actually was uh, uh, whole grid uh, where then they could uh, set a voltage and observe indeed current, so generation through these uh, voids. And uh, depending on the number, also depending on the, on the membrane and the number of voids, uh, the current was uh, uh, different. And uh, here you see, for example, a membrane without voids, no current, and this probably is a broken membrane where you have a free uh, transport of ions. And uh, this is a topic that is very interesting for us because it's again interfaces with liquid and 2D materials and we have just started a, a project where we study HPN but not only, also graphene with nanoporous and uh, mo uh, molybdeno disulfide uh, functionalized with, uh, with uh, porous and we study the transport of ions uh, through these pores, uh, and in, uh, we, we uh, study the relationship between the properties of the materials, the electronic structure, the um, uh, concentration of ions, uh, and uh, we uh, um, look at this uh, generation of blue energy by nanofluidics. With that, uh, this is uh, what we are studying now and this is a sort of a perspective uh, of our work. Uh, I hope to have given you an uh, overview of a typical application in uh, two-dimensional material science uh, done with the computers. Uh, as I explained, uh, I need uh, or we need a lot of collaborations, uh, computer time, software, so it's something that is obviously not the work of one person but uh, many and uh, very important, we need inspiration from experiment. And um, here is a, a bunch of people that uh, I need to thank. Uh, I prefer not to name one by one, also because probably I forgot to write up some name, but for sure the uh, group uh, uh, of Jürg Hutter and Jürg Hutter in, in person for the great support and all the collaborators that worked at simulations. The Physics Institute, uh, the uh, surface science uh, part that uh, is always uh, full of uh, very nice ideas, experiment and uh, exotic uh, and challenging uh, uh, system. Uh, another group we collaborated a lot with is at EMPA, uh, also nanotech at surfaces. They also do very beautiful experiments and it is a pleasure uh, to work uh, with them. There are uh, other collaborators around the world <laughs> that uh, obviously inspire and, uh, and uh, gave us input. The 
finance uh, um, institution, uh, University of Zurich, uh, but also SNF and uh, projects like LightTrack that uh, provides us collaborators and, um, and support the whole development team of uh, uh, CP2K, that it is a, a tool without which we couldn't do this type of simulation, is really the thing to use for a large condensed matter system by first principle. The computational facilities, that uh, is uh, obviously necessary to run this type of simulation. And uh, I cannot um, avoid mentioning uh, my best supporters that uh, always support my work, uh, whatever happens. <laughs> we smile. Thanks a lot. 